Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Fuller, and I am the Chief Sponsorship and Mission Integration Officer at St. Joseph's College. And tonight's event is sponsored by the Center for Faith and Spirituality at St. Joseph's College. And I have with me this evening two guests who are going to discuss with me and with us. At some point, we'll have uh, opportunities for conversation. Uh, the history and heritage of Jews and Catholics in the world. And my guests with me this evening are Dr. David Freidenreich, who is the Pulver Family Professor of Jewish Studies at Colby College, and Dr. Michael Connolly, retired professor of history at St. Joseph's College of Maine. So my interest here was uh, an event to talk about uh, kind of religious history of Maine, and tonight we're focusing on Jewish and Catholic history here. Uh, so I thought we'd start at the beginning. I'll start with you first, David, and that is if we could start the conversation with a little bit of history, that is, what when when do Jews first arrive in Maine? What do we know best historically, and where do they arrive? Where do they settle once they come here to Maine? Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for putting this together, and I'm really delighted to see so many people uh, here to participate in the conversation, and I very much hope that it is a participatory conversation as, as we go. The first Jews we know about in Maine were already here before um, Maine became an independent state. Uh, there were Jews here at the time of the American Revolution, not very many. Um, the first Jew we know anything about uh, lived in Union, Maine. He was a um, peddler who became a local tanner, um, who is literally a footnote in history because the historian of Union, Maine in the 1830s uh, thought he was unusual enough to merit a long paragraph describing how much everybody hated him. Um, which I think tells us something about the challenges that Jews faced integrating uh, into Maine's, um, really, Yankee culture. Um, Jews began to settle in Maine in larger numbers during the 1840s. The first congregation was founded in Bangor in 1849. Um, and members of that congregation also reported some challenges they had integrating into the broader community. Um, that congregation disbanded in the 1850s, but Jews continued to move in and out of the state, uh, really all the way through the oldest synagogues that still exist today were founded uh, at the turn of the 20th century. As a general rule, Jews who came to the United States settled in big cities. It's one of the reasons why not many came to Maine in the first place, and those who came to Maine tended similarly to settle in the urban areas. So Portland became the largest Jewish community. Bangor had been the largest when Bangor was in fact one of the largest cities in the state. Um, but many Jews who came to Maine did so to be um, peddlers and small town merchants. And so during the early 20th century, you could find individual Jews in many of Maine's towns and you could find synagogues in a well over a dozen different towns around the state. And, and Mike, the, for Catholics, I, if I understand correctly, the earliest Catholics were probably the French, French, correct, from the north? Well, actually, um, the French uh, connection with the Catholic Church in Maine was um, Samuel de Champlain, uh, which goes all the way back to the period, believe it or not, before Popham Beach colony and even before Jamestown. So in 1604, there was a small uh, settlement on St. Croix Island on the river between uh, New Brunswick, Canada and Maine. Uh, it didn't last very long because of the weather, of course, but uh, the Jesuits uh, who accompanied Samuel de Champlain uh, tried to set that up. But uh, early contacts in Maine, uh, were missionary contacts with the native tribes, and in particular the Passamaquoddies up in Eastport, uh, Pleasant Point, and um, then the Penobscots on Indian Island uh, near Bangor. Uh, the first Catholic church in, in uh, Maine was St. Patrick's in Newcastle near Damariscotta, and that actually is still standing from 1818 the oldest Catholic church in, uh, in New England, and one of the oldest uh, still operating Catholic churches in the entire United States. So that's St. Patrick's. Uh, Charles French uh, arrived here in Portland 
and was largely responsible for setting up what was uh, what is now or what was St. Dominic's Church, the oldest Catholic church in Portland, now uh, the, uh, the home of the main Irish Heritage Center. And the church was named St. Dominic's because Father Charles French, who spelled his name unusually F-F-R-E-N-C-H, it's a Norman uh, way of spelling the name, uh, he was originally a, an Anglican, but converted to the Catholic faith and was a Dominican. So therefore the church became St. Dominic's. So those are some of the early um, ones. I'm, I'm thinking about what, uh, what David just said. Uh, many things in common, of course, between the Jews and Catholics as far as um, immigrant populations arriving. Um, they tended to arrive, the Irish, in cities as well, Bangor, Portland, other cities, but there was one big exception to the rule, and I should mention that. The second bishop of Boston, Benedict Fenwick, attempted to set up an agricultural community in rural Maine. And so he purchased some land in the southern part of Aroostook County. The settlement was eventually named after him, Benedict Fenwick. So it's the town of Benedicta today. And you still will find Irish names there like Quayley and McAvoy and German Catholic names like Rush. And we've had students at St. Joe's with all of those family names over the years. And they largely survived by growing potatoes. Fortunately, the soil of Aroostook was good for that. So I'll let it go at that for the moment. Okay, let me add, add one piece to that story. Um, as I mentioned, Jews tended to settle in the large urban areas. Um, New York City became the home to um, a huge percentage of Jews in the United States. But there are stories of individual Jews who couldn't stand life in the big city. And one of my favorites is of somebody who kept on complaining that he wanted to go someplace where the weather felt more like home. He came from, from a northern part of Russia. And somebody told him, well, get on this train and take it as far as it goes. <laughs> and so he ended up in Holton <laughs> and became a potato farmer in Arista County. Um, now, he wasn't only farming potatoes, he was also brokering potatoes and selling them because, of course, he had networks in other places and, you know, taking advantage of those commercial aspects. But um, potato farming actually became one of the mainstays of uh, the very small Jewish communities of Fort Kent, Presque Isle, and other parts of uh, the northern part of the, of the uh, state. Hmm. That story by David reminds me that people come to Maine for many, many different reasons, and sometimes as funny as that one that you mentioned. Um, if I could, I'd like to mention the uh, second bishop of the Diocese of Portland. Uh, Portland became its own diocese, separating from, from Boston in 1855. And in 1875, the second bishop of, of Portland was a person, very interesting person by the name of James Augustine Healy. And then I think many of you might know of him. Bishop Healy's father was an Irish immigrant living in Georgia. His mother was a slave. So Bishop Healy was half black and half white, the first black Catholic bishop in America. And he served as the bishop of the diocese of Portland from 1875 until 1900. And you get a sense of this by some of the early uh, biographies that were written. One of them was called Beloved Outcast, and another one was called Dark Shepherd. So each of them makes reference to his race. And a more contemporary uh, book about the whole Healy family is Passing by White by James O'Toole from Boston College. But very interesting story of arriving in Maine. Mm. So, um, David, first of all, I enjoyed that story because I think it's one of the few times I've heard a story of someone coming to Maine for the cold, um, <laughs> actually be here uh, to enjoy the cold. So that's a, that's a wonderful story. Um, both of you mentioned, right, the even here in Maine, probably overall the propensity to settle in the cities, right? Now, in settling in the cities, were there did they settle in their own areas, own districts? Was there any kind of, that you know of, crossover between Jewish, Catholic, and other immigrant communities in the cities where they settled? Michael, you want to start? Sure. Um, in Portland, they lived, as the expression goes, cheek by jowl. Um, 
in Portland, most immigrant groups and, and uh, Russian Jews were among them, seemed to settle near the waterfront. India Street, if you are familiar with that, was sort of the home base for groups as they came in. First, the Irish. Um, that's my neighborhood today. I live on Munjoy Hill. There were three synagogues within walking distance of my home. Um, there was Etzheim, which is now the, the Jewish uh, Cultural Museum, uh, Sharif Hathila on Newbury Street, and uh, those two still exist, Not the second one not as a uh, synagogue anymore, but also just around the corner from there on Cumberland <coughs> Avenue was Aunt Sephard, so that was a Sephardic uh, synagogue. And so they lived in close proximity to the Irish, and in the latest novel that I just wrote, there's an interesting story of how the juxtaposition of the two of them come together. I've heard some stories from uh, Jews who grew up in those neighborhoods. Um, I have to say, none of them speak fondly of their relations living cheek by jowl with the Catholics. Um, I got all sorts of tales of, uh, of local anti-Semitism. Um, but more fundamentally, you know, why are immigrants settling in those neighborhoods? Because that's the cheap housing. And that's where, um, you know, the outcasts were settled. And you can actually find the, uh, the Maine Historical Society had an exhibition running for uh, the last several months, which included a map of downtown Portland, literally redlined with the neighborhood that um, banks and realtors agreed not to fund, not to support, to keep these immigrants in poor parts of the town. Um, and there were also efforts to limit the political power of folks living in those neighborhoods. And in that respect, Jews and Catholics found themselves in the same boat. I want to give a different uh, example of living cheek by jowl from Waterville, though. Uh, Waterville had um, tremendous tensions among various communities. There were the uh, Yankee population, the Irish Catholics, the Francos, and then there were two very small communities, the Lebanese Maronite Catholics and the Jews, who happened to be living right next door to each other um, geographically. And the stories that both the members of both communities tell about how closely they were interknit, uh, the Jews and the Lebanese, in part because they didn't want to associate with either the Irish or the Francos, and there was no way that they could pass as Yankee. Um, and so the different ways in which discrimination plays out and shapes the strategies that um, immigrants use to really get by and uh, eventually um, succeed in their efforts despite the uh, obstacles that they face, um, but they really face some challenges. But, uh, I, yes, I think that. immigrants then and now are very smart people. They've given up everything that they had in their home place, travel great distances, oftentimes speaking different language, wearing different kind of clothing, eating different kind of food, mm. Uh, and somehow they have survived and in many cases thrived. So I think that story, David, is a great one. They look out and search for their allies wherever they can find them. And I, I see Sister Mary George is, is here uh, listening in and maybe I'll give a little example of her dad if she doesn't mind. Uh, her dad was an Irish longshoreman uh, and a speaker of the Gaelic language. Portland Irish were kind of unique in the country in that they tended to come from Gaelic speaking areas in the Western part of Galway. So most people think that the Irish coming over had an advantage of speaking English. My, my grandparents did not speak English when they arrived. I don't know how much uh, Sister Mary George's parents did, but the Irish was their first language. And so they had to adapt and assimilate in that fashion. And so I think as with David's story, they had to find their own natural allies. I think that, that's a good segue then. You Something you mentioned, uh, David, when we started this conversation was how these communities were received in Maine. And if I understand correctly, here in Maine, the KKK started um, it, precisely because of immigrant communities like Catholics and Jews. Is that correct? 
Yeah, but let's be more precise. They were anti-Catholic. Okay. Well, they, you know, yeah, they were happy to target Jews while they were at it, but Jews weren't a threat. Mm. And the thing about organizations like the Klan um, is that they respond to the very success of the immigrant communities that they believe should not be succeeding. Um, we need to put those people back in their place because they're actually becoming competitors with us for the things that we believe we rightly deserve. Um, the Klan focused its attention on the Catholics, and Michael can say much more about that. The Jews face a different kind of challenge because the, um, the Mainers they were competing with were the businessmen. They were competing with middle class um, entrepreneurs, professionals, especially um, in the 1920s and 30s as Jews began to pursue college education and pursue uh, careers as doctors, teachers and the like, um, they found themselves um, being resisted by, uh, well, for example, in Bangor, um, Jews were not allowed admitting privileges at the local hospitals. Um, in Portland, Jews were not allowed to live in certain neighborhoods. Uh, there were efforts to restrict certain kinds of occupation. Um, Bowdoin had uh, no published admissions restrictions, but somehow, apparently coincidentally, but I can't imagine, for the span of a decade, there were precisely 13 Jewish students at Bowdoin every single year. And they published every year to make sure everybody knew how many of each religious community and even though the student body increased by 50%, there were always 13 Jews, maybe as high as 15 if they got their numbers wrong one year. Um, and so there were consistent efforts to keep Jews and to keep Catholics in their place. Maybe that was Bowdoin's idea of a baker's dozen. <laughs> Well, um, let me try to answer Chris's question as well. Um, and Chris, if you don't mind, I'll go back a little bit earlier than the Klan, because in the middle of the 19th century, you have the Know Nothing movement, the American Nativist uh, Party. And um, there was a very interesting uh, occurrence in Bath, Maine, in 1854, when a church was burned to the ground. Now, there are many pictures have appeared in multiple books about that, but the interesting thing is that that was a Protestant church. But the mistake that they had made was they, uh, the, the parishioners of the Protestant church had allowed the church to be used for Catholic mass as there was no Catholic church yet. And so that was the offense taken by the nativists. So they burned that church to the ground. Years later, of course, these nativist movements come back. Um, we have uh, examples of that today, I think, in America. Uh, but in the, eight, in the 1920s, of course, the rise of the KKK, again, um, you have the situation in Portland where there was a clavern uh, right on, on uh, Back Bay, not far from where USM is located today, a, a, a KKK clavern. And it burned to the ground, and there's a lot of stories, apocryphal, I'm sure, that were told about why the predominantly Irish fire brigade was a little bit late in getting there to put the flames out. But nonetheless, um, there was a march in Milo uh, that was uh, well documented. And then I think I tell the story, if you don't mind, mentioning St. Patrick's Church again up in Newcastle. I got this story from Florence Caston, who lived to be about 105 years old. And uh, some of you will remember Catherine Concanon, and she was living at St. Joseph's uh, uh, nursing home. Florence Caston was her roommate. They both lived to be over 100. Her father, believe it or not, actually served in the Civil War. So that made Florence Caston a Civil War orphan, one of the last ones in the entire country. Her father, who was living up around Newcastle, heard a rumor that the Klan was going to burn St. Patrick's to the ground. He told a Catholic friend about it because he was opposed to this kind of uh, treatment. The friend told the priest, and that night there was a, a slew of uh, parishioners from St. Uh, Patrick's Church who defended the church and who told the crowd that appeared, we know who you are, 
If anything ever happens to this church, we know where to go. And so the church still stands today. You know, I, I, one of the stories of Maine, too, with regard to the no-not things was the tarring and feathering of the priest who would become the first president of Boston College. Father John Baptist. Yeah. Yes. Now, you, you both mentioned also the strategies that immigrants use to adapt. Um, and uh, you made a brief reference to this, David, but you also write about this. So this is interesting to me. One of the ways that uh, Jews in Maine, I'm curious now about uh, the professions. You know, what, what, what were they doing? And you write about peddlers. Uh, and you use this interesting analogy that the peddlers, uh, the Jewish peddlers were kind of like the Amazon.com of their time. So can you share <laughs> us a little bit like who were they and how did they, what, what role did they serve? How did they serve in that capacity? Sure. So, you know, more broadly, Michael said that immigrants come with nothing. Well, they come with something. They have skills that they bring. They have knowledge and they use those, you know, that portable resource um, to make the best they can in their new environment, um, to face the challenges, to find the niche where they can make a living for themselves, make a better life for their families. For a variety of historical reasons, Jews were shunted into petty commerce in Europe. And so many Jews who came to the United States, and especially those who decided to make their way up to Maine, had experience as peddlers. Um, peddling is a very challenging profession. You've literally got a pack on your back for six days a week. You're walking out and around. The roads are horrible, but that's precisely why farmers don't want to take the time to come into town to buy things. And so the peddlers make loops on a weekly basis. They leave town on Sunday, come back on Friday, and they go to the same farms week after week. And in the process, they get to know the farm families, especially the women. They get to find out what it is that these women are interested in. They bring these women up to date on the latest urban fashions because, for instance, the Jewish merchants in Bangor are being supplied by wholesalers in Boston and New York. And so they're getting from Boston and New York the latest clothing, the latest furniture, the latest whatever it might be. And the merchants in town know that so many of their customers are never going to come into town. So they contract with local peddlers to go out and do the route. And the peddlers borrow the goods, go out and sell. At the end of the week, they pay back the goods they borrowed, borrow some more, and keep on earning money each week to the point that they can eventually open a shop in town themselves. That's when they can get married uh, because they can stay in one place. Uh, and if Bangor doesn't have enough places for uh, new merchants, they'll move down to Rockland or they'll move out to Belfast um, and so on. And you have an increasing array of Jewish merchants who then proceed to employ more Jewish peddlers. It's an entire economic um, ethnic niche that functions like Amazon in that there are communication networks going on. The peddlers are reporting what it is that the consumers want. The merchants send that information back to the wholesalers. The wholesalers provide the right kind of stuff. Everybody's got the information that they need. And ultimately, it's the people of Maine who are benefiting because they are being introduced to life-changing technology, buttons, pre-made clothing, things that were saving housewives a tremendous amount of time and increasing their quality of life. And because Jews were able to function in that niche, they were able to um, establish themselves as um, merchants in towns. Of course, the ones who weren't so successful as peddlers picked up stakes and tried their luck someplace else. Where on earth? Sorry, what was that, Michael? All of these immigrants uh, came uh, with a wealth of knowledge, uh, but how to apply that in a new setting, that was their challenge. And let, uh, I'll focus on the Irish. Uh, Irish men um, worked in labor, labor intensive, uh, longshore work, of course, loading and unloading the ships in, in coastal towns like Belfast and Bangor, Portland, of course. 
Uh, the Longshore Union in Portland was founded in 1880, uh, that having replaced uh, a number of black dock workers that used to work in Portland when the business was not as, as brisk as it became later on. But after the 1850s, Portland was connected with Montreal, uh, shipping out Canadian grain to Europe. So the Irish took over the Longshore work. Uh, also, they worked in various forms of construction. The mills of uh, Lewiston were largely built by Irish labor, and then they were um, employed uh, French workers coming down from the Beauce region of, uh, of Canada, of fellow, uh, fellow uh, Catholics. McGillicuddy is a name that is associated with the early stages of, of, uh, of Lewiston, even though everybody always thinks of it as a French town and then later a Somali town uh, these days. Um, in Portland, there was a Green and Maloney construction company. Among other things, they built the central fire station and also what we popularly call the time and temperature building. So it took great skill, you know, to, to be able to put all the materials together. And somehow they picked up these skills over the years. Irish women worked as domestics in the homes on the eastern and the western promenade. They worked in the big hotels like the Eastland Hotel and the old Falmouth Hotel. And later on, they found work in places like the telephone company. So those were the main uh, occupational uh, niches of the Irish. Now, one of the ways uh, by which these communities um, um, uh, arrived and, and, and tried to um, uh, adapt themselves obviously would be through um, what did they do with their professions, but it's also how did they organize their life as a community, right? So what can you share with us about the way these communities, you know, organize their communal lives together uh, in terms of that, that process of adaptation? Want to take that, David? You can start. How'd you go first this time, Mike? Okay. Um, the Irish were big into joining there were so many different organizations just in Portland alone, fraternal organizations, uh, labor organizations, religious organizations, sporting organizations. Uh, now, many of these were clannish in that they were mostly Irish or mostly Catholic, or uh, but sometimes they appealed across the board, but they found their way into many different areas. And I think, that that was very important to them because the, at first, uh, as with David's example, in Bangor and in Portland, they tended to live in communities that could almost be called ghetto communities. They were uh, low income communities, the housing was cheap and the work tended to be uh, close to where they were living. They had no other forms of transportation. But in joining these other organizations within the church and outside of the church, they opened themselves up to greater uh, opportunities. Jews organized in a variety of different ways, depending on where they lived. Um, you know, in the late in the late nineteenth century, when you have large numbers of Jews scattered all over the place, um, those Jews created kind of a statewide network um, of you know, it was almost a, a pen pal relationship. The uh, first Jewish organization founded in Portland was not a synagogue. It was a fraternal organization called B'nai B'rith. And its membership um, covered the entire state. There were members from Holton who I'm sure never attended an in-person lodge meeting in their lives, but they felt important they felt it important to be connected to a Jewish organization, uh, and they appreciated the life insurance benefits that came along with membership um, and being part of uh, a fraternal organization, just like so many of their neighbors were involved in the Odd Fellows or the Masons or uh, similar organizations like that. Jews created their own distinctly Jewish organizations like synagogues, but even though synagogues were really kind of parallel to the churches, um, they often created other kinds of parallel organizations when they were excluded from the mainstream organizations. So you would have um, a Jewish 
high school theater troupe if the Jews weren't allowed to participate in the mainstream one. You would have a Young Men's Hebrew Association to counterbalance the YMCA. Um, you would have Jewish country clubs. By 1950, Bangor alone was home to 16 different Jewish organizations, and the majority of Jews in Bangor were affiliated with at least three of them. By the 1960s, as Jews began to be more fully integrated within the mainstream society, uh, a lot of those Jewish organizations disappeared uh, because they only existed to provide alternatives um, in the face of the broader society. And once society integrates, um, those organizations had no reason to continue. And, and David, you've written about this as well. And we talked about this the other day. When we're speaking about the Jewish community, we're not only speaking of a of religious community, we're speaking of a cultural community as well, correct? We're speaking of a cultural community. We're speaking of an ethnic community. Uh, it's important to recognize that today, um, about one in five American Jews identifies as being of no religion. Right? That's what they tell survey, survey people. I am Jewish. What is your religion? None. <laughs> uh, and, and that makes perfect sense within a Jewish world. Um, many Jews uh, came to this country from Eastern Europe. They were um, dissatisfied with the um, traditional forms of religion at that time. Uh, many of them were influenced by uh, rising socialism in that part of the world. They took those ideas over into this country uh, even more so. Um, I keep on emphasizing the ways in which Jewish Americans really want to be American. Um, and given the high rates of non-religious identification here in Maine, it's no surprise that Jews don't identify religiously here in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are synagogues, but many of those synagogues focus on social justice work and on other forms of community building and cultural life uh, at least as much as on religious life. And there are many, many Jews in this state who don't affiliate with the synagogue at all, even as they strongly identify as being Jewish uh, and engage in all sorts of uh, Jewish cultural and uh, communal activities in one form or another. And as you, you've also pointed out, like for example, here in Portland, the Jewish Community Alliance serves a wide variety of people, the Jewish community and non-Jewish community as well. But there's, there's a number of Jewish founded service organizations, but they serve the entire community. Absolutely. And, and a great example of that here in Portland right now is Jewish Family Services, which was first established as uh, its own independent entity in the 1980s as a means of providing support to uh, Jewish refugees from the, from the then Soviet Union. And um, recently they announced that they have been designated as uh, one of the organizations that will be helping with Afghan refugees uh, as they are coming to settle in Portland. Uh, and as the um, National uh, Jewish Refugee Support Organization puts it, we used to support refugees because they were Jewish. Now we support refugees because we are Jewish. Uh, and that's really a fundamental aspect of American Jewish identity, um, recognizing that historical experience of persecution, and in many cases, using that as an impetus to uh, work for better integration today. Interesting, because one of the other organizations that helps welcome refugees is also Catholic Charities. Same yes, I was going to mention that, right? Yeah. I think that uh, that there's so many parallels. And again, every time when David speaks, it reminds me of a parallel uh, with either the Catholic or the Irish. Um, and so Catholic Charities is a good uh, a segue for that. I'm also thinking about uh, my good friend, David Brenneman in Portland, and he used to invite me down to the old Jewish Community Center that was in downtown Portland. There were so many things going on in that center, not just for adults, but for younger people too, sports and other activities. Um, Hebrew Day School, uh, he attended all the way up until he joined us at uh, Jack Junior High School, so probably seventh grade. Um, and of course, the equivalent on the other side would be the parochial schools, not just in Portland, but through the entire state of Maine. And I'm, I'm seeing uh, Sister Miriam Callan here and also uh, Sister Mary George O'Toole, and I'm sure there might be others who served a good deal of their life 
uh, in teaching or administrating uh, these uh, parochial schools all the way from St. Agat and Holton all the way down to York County. So it was really labors of love that they did. And of course, my connection was with St. Joseph's College, uh, Sisters of Mercy administered uh, school. Uh, one other thing, it's kind of related to that. Um, you were asking about organizations and, and David might want to piggyback on this one too, but there were support organizations for Ireland and Irish freedom. And it goes all the way back to the time of the famine, famine relief. But then it goes up to the 1920s, the Friends of Irish Freedom. Um, and when various atrocities were happening in Dublin and other places, and then leading up to support for Sinn Féin um, around the time of the Easter Rebellion. So I did some research with the Irish longshoremen and discovered that even though they didn't have a lot of excess capital, they each year did send money over to support these groups. So whatever they had, uh, they were happy to share. Yeah, and it's the same is definitely true for uh, Jewish support for the founding of the State of Israel. Uh, and uh, in many cases, continuing connections between uh, Jews in Maine and the State of Israel. Mm. So let's, um, we'll get to some uh, questions from our uh, visitors with us in just a moment. So let's kind of bring it to the present in terms of ways in which, in your estimation, that you think these communities have contributed to Maine and they've been shaped by Maine. Uh, why don't you go first, Mike? Oh, you want me to? I, oh, I thought we were going to open it up to... to I think to, that's my last question, was ways in which you think the, these communities shaped Maine and ways they've been oh, shaped by Maine. Okay. I just want to, first of all, uh, say to Sister Mary George that this green bottle that I have here is Topo Chico with a twist of lime and absolutely no alcohol in it. So I just wanted to let her know that. So, um, oh my gosh, let's start with politics. Um, I'm going to be speaking uh, on a Zoom tomorrow from this same place with my cousin Tim setting me up again with technology um, to a conference in Galway. And the question in Galway is, how did people from Connemara uh, help to shape the political life in Maine or in America? And there's so many examples that we could use. In Portland alone, you have father and son, Senator Gerard Conley Sr. and Senator Gerard Conley Jr. And of course, uh, the example I'm going to be using tomorrow is ex-Governor Joe Brennan. Now, Joe Brennan's mother came from the same little townland that my father was born in, Califinish, in County Galway. And he went on to be elected as a two-term governor of Maine, as most of you will remember. But he also served in the um, legislature here in Maine. He was a U.S. representative, and in the later years of his uh, working career, was on the Federal Maritime Commission. So there's so many examples that we could point to, but... I would uh, start by answering politics. It was in their blood. And David? There are certainly individual Jews who were very active in uh, Maine politics, in um, Maine culture, um, in Maine athletics. I'm, 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 the, the, the image that's coming to my mind right now are some of the entertainers at Old Orchard Beach. Um, and that's a great place for uh, Jewish Catholic interaction. Um, again, shaped by the exclusion of the Yankees who, you know, prefer to conquer. Um, but to me, I think it's actually about the ways in which as Jews became Mainers, they helped to redefine what it means to be from Maine. Um, and I think the same is true for Catholics, that there becomes a shifting nature of how we see the very place and culture in which we live once Jews are regarded as part and parcel of the community, um, that shapes things. And one political example that I'll use to conclude, um, oh, Mills, Janet's father, I'm forgetting his first name, 
um, Peter. came down. What? Peter Mills. Peter Mills um, came down to Portland and um, attended a Portland Symphony Orchestra concert. And he discovered afterwards, to his shock, that the uh, recently appointed conductor of the Portland Symphony was denied access to the Cumberland Club. Why? Because he was Jewish. And Peter Mills stewed over this all the way back on his drive home. And the next day, picked up a call to the governor and said, let's have some fun. And wow. the two of them put together legislation that for the first time denied liquor licenses to private organizations that refused to admit Jews and Blacks as members. And within a year, the Cumberland Club had its first Jewish member, and <laughs> those barriers fell once and for all. Um, and that's something that Jews did not themselves do. It was allies within the community. But Jews had earned the respect of those allies, such that this legislation sailed through Augusta. Interesting. Well, now let's open it up to anyone who's joined us this evening who might have a question. Would someone like to ask a question of either of our guests tonight? My question is, um, just out of curiosity, what was the Italian, um, like, did, did, what was the Italian migration situation like in Maine? And how did that, or did it have any influence on the Catholic experience? So Michael could be better to answer that than I, but let me do the best I can in brief. Um, there was a significant Italian population in, um, in Maine, but not nearly as large as the Irish and the Franco. Uh, and so those two communities really dominated at the statewide level. And while you'll have individual uh, Italian churches, um, they don't have as broad of an influence. Um, kind of like the situation in Waterville, where it's not the Italians who come in, but rather the, uh, the Maronite Lebanese. Uh, and they had to struggle to get permission to form their own church on the grounds that, well, they're neither Irish nor, um, nor Franco. So, uh, Mike, you're back with us. Thank you. Um, oh, good. We, had, we can't see you, but can you see us? Over? Oh, there we are. We can okay, see you. Um, we actually had a question um, that was asked as you dropped out, and that was about the Italians that came to Maine. Any, any yes. information you have about the Italian migration to Maine, where they settled, or so a little bit of information? Good, yeah. I'm happy to deal with that. Um, I grew up with the Chickamanchinis and the De Petri Antonios and the uh, Mastro Pasquas and the De Lucas. My neighborhood was, was mostly Irish and Italian. And the interesting thing was that there's only less than one city block between the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception and St. Peter's Church. Like one Saint being Peter's predominantly Peter, yeah. Irish Catholic and the other one being predominantly Italian Catholic. The intermarriage between those two, of course, is, is renowned, not just in Portland, but I'm hearing about it even out here in Colorado. The person I met today was of uh, Irish and Italian background. So they shared the religion, they certainly didn't share the cuisine, but uh, the Irish gained on that front. So um, yeah, absolutely. And at Portland High School that I attended, uh, you know, we had Jews, we had Italians, we had Irish, we had, you know, the works. And now, of course, immigrant communities from refugee communities, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Somalia, Sudan, uh, and I'm sure now Afghanistan. So. It really, Portland High School really was a melting pot school back then, and it was to all of our advantage. You know, Mike, it raises a question for me, which is about um, these communities. So I moved here from Montana, and south of where I live in Helena was Butte, Montana, which was heavily settled by Irish who worked the mines, the copper mines there. And I know, I knew some of the priests who grew up in that community, and they said, you know, you even knew something about someone based on the parish they were from even if one parish was Irish and the other parish was Irish, you still knew something about the person. Was it like that here in Portland as well, that the parishes were arranged in a way that there was a personality to them? There was something about, you knew something about someone if you, they told you they were from a certain parish? That was absolutely true. Uh, in Galway, Galway is a county, 
and there's various regions in, in Galway. The ones that um, sent people to Portland would have been Kusharga, which means beside the sea. And uh, that goes from Galway City all the way out. And then there's another one called Iris Anach, um, where my grandparents came from near Karna. And there was another one up in the mountains uh, where Sister Malachi uh, um, came from. Uh, Sister Malachi was from Kornamona. Uh, so those were three regions. And it, it was very clannish. If you weren't from exactly the right region, uh, maybe they wouldn't have as much time for you. That's the way it was put. We don't have time for you. And of course, in Portland, you have the uh, parochial differences between the cathedral parish and St. Dominic's parish, the East End and the West End. And uh, when Joe Brennan was chosen as the first recipient of the Clada Award, it was absolutely certain that Gerard Conley from the West End had to be chosen as the second recipient. <laughs> <laughs> These two what you're describing really, really matches the Jewish experience as well, um, that Jewish immigrants, uh, to the extent that they could, really associated with folks from their hometown, and if not their hometown, their home region. Um, and, you know, in a place like New York, they really um, hyper-segregated. In Maine, there were tensions between the ones who came from Germany and the later ones who came from various places in Eastern Europe, but there was much more of a melting pot within those regions because they couldn't segregate too much. Uh, in Portland, you do have some segregation. Um, Michael, you mentioned the three synagogues in the East End. They were primarily the Polish synagogue, the Russian synagogue, and the Lithuanian synagogue. Uh, mm -hmm. And Anche Sfard is not Sephardic. It's a particular liturgical tradition associated with Poland. Um, but I want to I want to riff on on uh, what you were saying about Casablanca because there's a fascinating tale about a North African Jewish connection here in Maine. The vast majority of Jews who settled in Maine came from um, Europe, more specifically northern climes. That weather is a really big deal. People did choose Maine for the weather, uh, and they always came from northern Germany, from northern Russia, and so on. And during World War II, um, a Jewish soldier from Waterville served in North Africa and fell in love with and married uh, a Jewish woman from Algeria, brought her back to Waterville. And the community in Waterville refused to believe that she was Jewish because she'd never heard of latkes and matzo balls and all the other Eastern European Jewish foods and so she needed to learn how to make real Jewish food before she was accepted as a member of the Waterville Jewish community. It's mm. a great story. Uh, I would like to um, maybe mention an example of uh, assimilation that is going on within the Catholic Church today because of um, the necessity of clustering. So use the example of Westbrook, Maine. There were three Catholic churches, St. Edmund's, St. Mary's, which was predominantly Irish Catholic, and then, of course, the much larger church, St. Hyacinth, which was French. So you've got those three traditions, and you have to make a new cluster name. So what did they come up with? St. Anthony of Padua. <laughs> so, you know, I think that that was a, an attempt to try to not to alienate one group or another, but it just goes to show you some of the challenges that exist. I wanted to kind of ask David if I could a question. Sure, sure. absolutely. Years ago, David, I met Rabbi Harry Skye. And oh my God, it, it just, uh, you know, what would life have been like if I had never met Harry Skye? He was such a, an... We're on a panel together. He asked a very probing question. He asked the question, can you still have ethnicity? Can you still have uh, Jewish or Irish identity without a community? Because at the time, that probably in the 70s, the neighborhoods were breaking apart. People were going to the suburbs. People were moving away. And so it's a broad question. Um, what's your thoughts on that, David, about ethnicity and, and religion without necessarily a community? So 
It's yeah. fascinating that he would have asked that question in the 70s because that was a really live issue at the time. In the 1930s and 40s, Jews were living in dense Jewish neighborhoods, whether it's, you know, particular neighborhoods in New York City or, um, you know, Monroe Hill East End area in Portland. And as they move out of those dense areas into the suburbs, especially after World War II, they begin to spread out. And what happens when they spread out is that suddenly they join synagogues because where their parents lived, they knew they were Jewish. There were, you know, Yiddish signs on the streets. There were bagels and Jewish food and various other kinds of things. They were with their own people. They, they had that identity that was ethnic. And in the 1950s, because of suburbanization and also, frankly, because of the Red Scare and the notion of, you know, one nation under God, all their Christian neighbors are going to churches. They start going to synagogues, not so much because they suddenly got religion, but because synagogues became the place for community. It's not that community ceased to exist in suburbia. It's that community was redefined. It was redefined in terms of an institution. And what began to happen in the late 70s and accelerating through the 80s and 90s to, the, to today is that the next generation of Jews stopped connecting to synagogues. It didn't mean that they weren't connecting to Jewishness or to community, but they had to find new ways of doing it. And so today, a lot of that Jewish community connection is happening online. It's happening through organizations like the Main Jewish Film Festival. It's happening in a variety of different ways that don't look like the old religious connections or even the older, you know, neighborhood community connections. Um, and it's absolutely true that over time, fewer and fewer Jews are bothering to connect. They're just assimilating into the mainstream of American society. Uh, and many, many Catholics have done exactly the same thing. Uh, religion can bind people and keep them distinctive, but the forces of integration are often much more powerful. The question for today is, what are the ways to keep communal identity, keep the value of ethnicity, not only in the face of declining religiosity, but also in the face of the very positive trend that um, denies ethnocentrism, denies the notion of our group's better than your group. Well, if our group's not better than your group, why should I still connect to my group? Like that is a major challenge for all sorts of communities, ethnic, religious, and otherwise. Uh, and there are a variety of new strategies being employed. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, what people 30 years from now say when they look back on this period. Interesting. You know, and your, your, your point, Mike, too, makes me think of here in Portland where we have immigrant communities, no longer the Irish and Italians now, but now it's the French-speaking Africans at, at Sacred Heart, uh, or the, the, the Spanish-speaking community at Sacred Heart, or I understand there's now a mass in Arabic, or there's a mass in Vietnamese. So there, these, are, these are the contemporary immigrant communities, right, which are, are forming, arriving here and forming these identities. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what their path or their trajectory will become once they become more acclimated, assimilated, if you will, to the, the, the culture here. So, if history is any guy, absolutely. Be, I think the same of, thing everybody else has done. Yeah. yeah. I think of a graduation ceremony at Portland High School today, and you hear names from 30, 40 different countries around the world. And uh, it, it really is quite remarkably different from the years in the 1960s where I was attending. There was an Irish historian by the name of Larry McCaffrey. And uh, he came from Chicago and always wanted to make the point that the Irish were in other places other than Boston and New York. Um, Chicago, for example, in Butte, Montana, we were just at Leadville today. And Butte, Montana, of course, was a big Irish uh, mining community, part of the Rockies. But Larry McCaffrey wrote a book. Yes, it was. And one of the last chapters was, was entitled From Ghetto to Suburb, colon from some place to no place. So 
I think we have to address that issue and find our someplace again. Yeah. But I do want to finish with one question because obviously one hour is not enough to cover this kind of history. Can each of you make a recommendation? If people are interested in, in pursuing and understanding these histories better, can you make a recommendation for us of a book, a website, something where people might go if they want to kind of continue to pursue their interests? So I am in the process of putting up in the chat uh, right. the website of the Maine Jewish History Project. It's uh, a site that I manage. Um, many of my students' papers are up there. Uh, all of my papers on uh, the Jews of Maine. Um, in fact, uh, Michael, there may even still be some material associated with the uh, conference that uh, you and I last saw each other at on migration to Maine uh, up through that website. It's a great resource. Uh, all really designed to be accessible to uh, a general readership. Uh, and it's a great place to uh, learn more about uh, Maine's Jewish history. Great, thank you. And Mike, any recommendations you have for people who are interested in? Yes, I'll, I'll be very parochial if you'll sure. allow me. Uh, the, the Maine Irish Heritage Center at the Old St. Dominic Church has a wonderful website and uh, they have all kinds of activities that are happening there. Uh, and they have a collection of videos uh, about Irish culture and about Ireland today. So I would recommend that people, if they wanted to go on the website for the Maine Irish Heritage Center. Okay, and that's easy to find. Just Google it, it's really easy to find and find the website. Well, this is excellent. Well, I wanna thank you both for joining me this evening for this conversation. And I wanna thank all of you that's right. who tuned in uh, for this conversation. I hope you found it informative. I hope you learned a little bit more about these two communities. Uh, how they contributed to life here in Maine and how they were shaped by their lives here in Maine. Uh, and I hope you'll join us for future events as well, hosted through the Center for Faith and Spirituality.